Jan Gunter. Thanks. Okay, is it running? Yeah, hi, I'm Benjamin. I'm the founder of Alasco and uh, have started another company before. Uh, today I want to talk about how I negotiate venture deals. So you might have seen that the title of my speech has changed a little bit because I, when I prepared this talk, um, I stumbled across the fact that I've actually only sold one company. So uh, that really doesn't make a whole presentation from my point of view. And the other thing is that I'm not an expert, I'm a founder which means that I don't want to give any how-to session or presentation because I only have experience and that is very specific. So that's why I want to talk how I negotiate venture deals. And whenever you hear something where I say you should, please keep in mind that it, I'm talking to myself a lot and it should mean Benjamin, you should, because I use this kind of playbook that I will show in a couple of minutes uh, for myself all the time. A little bit more background, so my entrepreneurial journey started 10 years ago and I'm very proud that I can be here on stage talking about negotiations because my first negotiation was more luck than preparation, I would say. So 10 years ago, me and my friends we were, were still studying here in Munich and we had our first company called Stylight. Uh, we went to Hot Spring Ventures for our first investments and they accepted after tough negotiations, um, our, our deal. We went back to the office and we got a recap via mail and we were like, oh, that is better than what we expected. So what happened is that we mixed up pre-money valuation and post-money valuation, but nevertheless, it was for the better for us. So um, that was the first real negotiation I can remember um, at Starlight. So um, for eight years, we've been active in, in, in the company and we've been we had a couple of um, venture financing and two years ago we sold the company to Proceedum here in Munich. Uh, since then I kind of also switched sides and I also accompanied different negotiations um, and investment rounds. For example, one of them at Personio where I first was an, as an investor I negotiated as, as a business angel to get into the company and then in the Series A I supported um, the team as a board member to raise the, the follow-up round. Uh, right now um, I, I got together with two of my former co-founders again. We started a new company called Alasco. Uh, what we do or what our mission is is to reduce cost and timing of construction projects. And if you go to alasco.de, you can see why that's exciting and you can see all the job offerings we have, but that's all the advertising I, I was allowed to do on stage. So uh, first of all, I think there are basically two kind of negotiations. The first negotiation is the one that you can see in cool movies. When you see on the social network Mark Zuckerberg going into meetings, negotiating tough and they get a deal and everybody's fighting around that. Uh, that happens. Um, and it's fun, I really love that, um, um, especially because this can be a very physical experience. Not towards your opponent, because that would be the definition of a fight, but towards yourself. So when I was in the final negotiation when we sold our co first company, um, I was on my way back home to my family and I had to drive 100 kilometers per hour on the autobahn on the very right lane because I couldn't do anything else. My whole body was shaking. I was still get goosebumps when I think about the situation. So this is really something, it's so intense that everything kind of, um, kind of mingles in, into one, one experience in this negotiation. That's why I, I love this, this, these final uh, negotiations. Uh, but uh, what the movies never show is the, the time frame, the process that leads to this final negotiation. And I think this is um, always where you, you can win a negotiation is when you get there. So um, I want to focus more on the process, what happens um, from the very first day to the very, very last end. Because you have to negotiate all the time. From the very first moment when you talk to an investor, um, actually, they started the negotiation. If they say hello and you, you respond to that, and then you, you agree where you meet, who will be in a meeting, these are all these little, uh, little negotiations along the way. You want to negotiate about 
uh, the timing about access to people, to information, to your clients, and so on and so on. So for me, a negotiation really starts with hello. Um, I, I built a little playbook for myself uh, that I always can remind myself what to do when a negotiation starts. Uh, you will see in a couple of minutes why, why it's uh, helpful for me. Now it's not so secret anymore, but uh, actually whenever um, I get into a negotiation or a round of finance, um, I try to get myself uh, to be aware that you have quite a balance of power and information, a disbalance. So the investor has more power than I have because he has money, that's an easy one, but also because he has a negotiation muscle. So I think, um, I, I think I accompanied 10 to 15 rounds of finance or whatsoever in 10 years. Uh, that's what they do in kind of a month. And uh, for me, a negotiation is really about trying and practicing it all the time. Uh, it's comparable if, you, if I would go to a bodybuilder and tell them, yeah, I go to a gym or every once in a, every other month as, as well. So I'm a bodybuilder too. It's just not true. So. Um, the other thing is that you have also a, a disbalance of urgency. So first of all, the importance of the outcome is super important for the founder. Actually, it's essential in most of the cases. And a VC has a portfolio, has a couple of deals going on, and maybe he misses this one superstar, but nevertheless, they can balance that. And the other thing is the knowledge about your company. Uh, nobody knows as much about your company as you do, and basically also about the industry. So these are like two things that I always try to uh, make myself aware of when, when I start a negotiation. Uh, because what I want to do when I create or design the process for, for a venture round, I always try to get into this phase as soon as possible where we can negotiate on eye level. And actually, um, there are a couple of tools that I want to show. So first of all, increasing the urgency for the investor. Second, to increase the power that I have as a, as a founder. And then being prepared for this final negotiation at the very end. So uh, actually two things I want to highlight in terms of urgency is like designing a very, very good timeline and then how to create excitement on the investor side. Um, I think the first negotiation with every VC is the timeline. So when I go out and tell people that um, I'm supporting somebody or I'm doing a round of finance myself, um, first thing that I tell them is this will be the timeline and can you agree on that? Because every VC I've met says, yeah, we can move fast. Uh, we had this one round that only took three months, uh, three weeks, and so on and so on. And I want to get some proof on that. So the first thing I do is to uh, tell them, yeah, it's great that you, that you can move very fast, but can you quickly commit that, please, uh, in, in an email? And then it starts, oh, yeah, I have to look. Uh, there's a holiday of my partner in this week. And then you're, you're already in the negotiation. The second one is um, creating excitement. So I think excitement is the combination of strategy and storytelling. And in my opinion, strategy is more important because that's basically what your company is about. And whenever um, I see a, a company that has a great strategy and can present it, um, I'm sure that they can also present it towards their team and rally them behind my ideas, uh, their ideas. So that's really the, the important part. Like just looking at presentations, how Facebook, the pitch deck that Facebook used for the first round of finance or whatsoever, that's just a little part of the story. So I put a lot of energy, a lot of time in, in strategy and in communication of strategy, and to be honest, quite few time in storytelling itself. So the second one, um, how can I increase the power that I have in, in negotiations? Um, it's not money, I can't balance that. Um, so what uh, I think is helpful is building up alternatives, of course, and then a very active process management. So something I also tend to forget uh, in the course of negotiations or finance rounds is that there's always the option to not do a deal. It's usually not the best option, that's why you aim for a deal, but I always try to think about the scenario in very detail. What happens if I don't get the money? Will the world go down? Will the company go down or whatsoever? So just taking the fear out of this uh, situation or this scenario really helps me to um, yeah, 
have a stronger presence and I have a stronger clear uh, viewpoint and negotiation standpoint when I go into a negotiation with the investors. Um, second one, uh, again about the timeline. We already talked about the first uh, negotiation, like the commitment on the timeline. Um, I think at the moment good ideas and good teams are really a scarce resource. Money is quite uh, spread across the whole market, way more than, than we've seen 10 years ago, five years ago, or three years ago. That's why I think the resource that we have in, in negotiations is access to information and people that we can play with. Because what I always try to do, and it hasn't really worked out uh, a lot of times, is to create a dynamic where all the investors are kind of the same track and the same speed. And the way that I try to do that is to always have this tit-for-tat situation with investors. So when people say, oh, can you send me a teaser? I can tell them, yeah, can you commit on the timeline first, please, that I can show you more information. Yeah, can we meet for a pitch? I want to make sure is there the partner on board in the meeting as well? And it goes like that. If you have a working session, um, for me it's also important to have all stakeholders that are in the decision-making process on investor side uh, at the table and actually hear what I, I have to say about my company. And so it goes on through the whole process. And because the, the one thing is uh, at the moment, it's good deals are highly competitive and I think the worst deal for an investor is the one he hasn't seen. So I try to, to, to generate this kind of dynamics and this fear of missing out when it comes to rounds of finance. Then, uh, last thing, um, being prepared for negotiation. I would defer that for a company perspective and on a very personal perspective. So these are the, the four phases um, that I think of when I think about an investment round. Starting with the preparation, um, building up the strategy, rallying everybody behind the strategy, uh, creating the pitch, uh, creating all the materials for the due diligence that you can think of, and creating a target list of investors that I cluster in A, B, and C. Uh, then starts the beauty contest, like going out, talking, pitching with the investors. I usually start with the Ds on my target list to refine the pitch and refine the messaging. So that's my kind of storytelling uh, preparation. And so it goes on to the very final negotiation, where I think the two most helpful uh, things that you've heard about from Matthias before is the license to negotiate, having this strict canvas of where you can negotiate and where you can't. And of course, the setup. So selling the companies highly emotional because for the founder itself, it's, it's a life changer. For the person on the other side, it's one deal of many. Um, that's why the setup and not having all founders in a room uh, when it comes to final decision uh, is really essential. Something a lot of, uh, I've seen a lot that people tend to forget or founders tend to forget is the last step, like the feedback loop, uh, talking to everybody who was involved in the process, the different investors personally, telling them about your decision, why you've chosen to go a different path or a different, with a different investor. So where comes uh, the preparation? I think the first one is clear um, on more in information and having everything prepared from a company perspective. But I think um, it's also important in all the negotiations that I have been in that the company is prepared that I won't be around very often. Because I have two problems, um, like I had to moderate this process and to negotiate. On the other hand, I'm also in a different phase. So um, I never get out of the situation that I tend to focus more on the short-term gains because you mean, I mean you're more or less transparent for the whole uh, transaction phase that uh, all investors want to have the newest update about numbers. So I always tend to focus on short-term optimization and not about the long-term strategy of the company anymore. That's why I always try to really take negotiation holidays where my co-founders uh, take over responsibilities or roles that I have uh, normally. The second one is the personal preparation. So. Uh, whenever we come into a final phase of a, a negotiation, I start going through all the trainings, um, I read all the books, I watch the movies, so that I really get into the mood of negotiating. And the other thing is like also physical preparation. Um, I try to go on holidays or at least take some days off before this final preparation. Because the second part to the story uh, from the very beginning when we sold a company was that after 
I was yeah, driving and shaking all the time um, after, after we sold the company. I got ill for two weeks, and that's also uh, a pattern that, that happens all the time. So that's, that's it from my side. I think it's the best time to start a company, the best time to raise money right now. So have fun with that, and feel free to contact me at benjamin.gunter at alaska.d. Thank you. The, if we can just get the Slido questions up, I'm sure there are some pressing questions for, uh, for Benjamin here. Did you support, <laughs> such as M&A consultants, to drive the deal and the negotiation? Um, yeah, so we, I've briefly shown the different phases of the negotiation. And in our specific case, we wanted to make sure that and the market phase, then, then we don't miss any, anybody who's interested. So that's where we used an M&A consultant, but we took them out uh, when it came to the negotiations because the incentives are not aligned at some point anymore. If they take longer, like than three months or something, the M&A consultant gets pressure from their partners, so they have to close it. And I had the feeling that the incentives are not uh, parallel anymore, where they talk you into deals um, because they're not involved anymore and want to close this mandate. This was my personal impression, and it was pretty, yeah, that's how we did it. Uh, and now, Benjamin, my, in, my interest, um, or, or the interesting thing about your presentation, you know, you have a clear process, you have a clear um, idea, a framework. When did you decide that you needed to do that, that you couldn't just wing it, so to speak? What happened that you said, okay, I can't just do things uh, the way everybody does it. I need to have a clear framework. Actually, I would say in the middle of my first company or something, we had just where we tried to introduce more channel process for everything, and it worked in different fields. So I had said, why should negotiation be an art? There's a tool set, and there's, of course, passion or interest in the topic. But actually, I think it's a balance of both that really improves your negotiation skills. Okay. And we have some more uh, questions coming in. For the M&A consultant, a fixed sum or a percentage? Actually, I, I think it doesn't solve the, the general problem of uh, the incentivization. If you have a fixed sum for the M&A consultant, their budget will uh, reduce over time, same as percentage. Um, if they know in which ballpark you will be, they just want to push you and not wait for this stellar exit that might come or something. Um, Actually, I, I think it doesn't make a difference at all. Uh, the next question, did you ever make an investment deal with someone you definitely didn't like? Uh, no, luckily not. Um, and I think <laughs> that's where um, also this no deal deal kicks in. So just accepting any deal is not a good solution or it's sometimes on the long term, in my opinion, maybe worse than uh, uh, than neglecting a deal. Because you have, if you have people that are not the best VCs, that don't really understand your business, that they just have deep, deep pockets or uh, a lot of money, it doesn't really help you in, uh, in, the, in the industries that I'm active in. Okay. How many of your deals actually did work out in your proposed nine weeks? Uh, it wasn't a whole timeline. So you also have the shareholder agreement afterwards, but I would say in average it was uh, 12 weeks. Most okay. of the deals that, that I've seen, yeah. And then we see here uh, from Ruth, who did the negotiations finally without being involved? Um, actually, I mean, that's the, the setup that Matthias uh, talked about, the FBI setup. Mm -hmm. You can be in a negotiation but not talking. That, that's, a, that's a way to get out of this emotional stress um, by letting your lawyer or, or a negotiator talk. Uh, that works pretty good for me. Okay. Then we see from Anonymous, with how many investors do you advise to negotiate in parallel to create the urgency for the investor? Yeah, actually, I presented how I tried to create <laughs> <laughs> urgency. It hasn't really always worked out, to be honest. In um, most deals, it was at the end, like, less one wins, but... Um, um, 
I, w I would say I always started with 15 to 20 investors in every round that I've accompanied. Okay. And how did you find your buyer? Did you have more than one? What was that process like? Okay. <laughs> Um, actually, I'm, I can't really dig too deep in or share too many details of this uh, of the exit, thanks to the legal restrictions. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, this is also where M and A advisor can help. If you want to search for a buyer and you don't have all the access to best of people in Menlo Park or whatsoever, you can use them for exactly that for uh, finding out if if there's somebody out there on the whole world um, who wants to buy your company. So you've clearly hit a nerve because the questions are really <laughs> streaming in right now. How do you align incentives between co-founders before going into a negotiation? And that's, a, that's a good question. Yeah. Actually, maybe I should have started with that, with the internal negotiation. Um, it's what I had in, in the process of strategy that for me also involves having alignment with all the, the founders. And I think there's no no hack for that or something or strategy. It's just finding out what everybody wants and putting that into a framework, into a license to negotiate it works. Uh, that was uh, uh, very different, difficult for us as well. And you're going to have to help me so I don't butcher the German in the next one. <laughs> but how did you and your company founders coordinate the exit? Was there a negotiation leader, someone with? The Hut auf. Yes. So, yeah, actually, I was responsible for, for the negotiation, but of course, I had support of my founders uh, for coaching me as well in, in the negotiation, uh, but also like keeping the business running uh, during the whole process, uh, which is really essential. So I think everybody had a role in this process. Uh, it's not only the negotiator who's always in the focus. Okay, and here's a really good question. You know, we talk a lot about tough negotiations. What was the tough negotiation? What are the tough topics when you're talking about tough negotiations? Mm, I think um, if somebody, something has not been clear in the, in the first phase of the process, then you're, you think you're in the final uh, negotiation and you see, oh no, we're, we're not there yet. And then you have all the people at the table and you see, okay, actually we're, we're in, the, in the wrong setup uh, here. So that was always where we tried to yeah, get this information and being clear on, info, on an information level so that we can go back to a more negotiation level, that we all, that we have everything transparent, everybody has the same understanding of the deal, of the dimensions of the deal, so that you can actually negotiate and that there are no misunderstandings in the information where, for example, pre-money valuation or post-money valuation or where people talk right. about different things. And I think that's important because sometimes people think the negotiations are tough because of the topic, but sometimes it's the situation or the circumstance, and that's what makes it very tough. And I think that's an important, uh, important distinction uh, to make because, uh, as Matthias mentioned in his speech, you know, it's only tough if that's your mindset, right? If you're negotiating against yourself and you have that mindset that it's tough. Um, do you feel negotiation tactics are the same with corporate partnership deals? Um, I've only went through a couple of corporate partnership deals, so my experience there are quite limited. Um, but they felt easy compared to uh, investor uh, relations as, as I've done it. Yeah. And why? It, it was more like a partnership, like um, where you try things out if you have the right expectation setting. Mm -hmm. And when it's quite low, then it's easier to negotiate. Right. If you say, let's, let's try something. That was at the very beginning of Starlight, where we had a huge publisher network that, that, we, um, that we tried to build up. We had to, to work with all the big corporates uh, and publishers. And they were, they were just keen. We were there in the right place. So it was, didn't yeah. really feel like a negotiation, to be honest. Sure. Uh, and then we have something interesting. How do you uh, best avoid dilution? Yeah, easy way not to take an investor, but um, I think there, there's no best case. Um, you try to find a, a price which is not transparent, as a price mm -hmm. on your company, and at one point you have to accept it or not. So I don't think there's anything you can actively do. There's always this point where you, s where you see you're not motivated anymore because your shares are going down that fast, but then again, it's a decision of not doing a deal. Yeah. 
Uh, and this is from France. How do you find out if an investor is really interested? I, mean, I think there are a couple of tools that I try to use. So for example, when people come in and say, yeah, I've looked at the construction space a lot, and I see a lot of companies, I just ask them, yeah, OK, what's your hypothesis then? And, uh, uh, yeah. And if something really <laughs> comes in where they say, OK, I see this position in here, this company there, and you nicely fit in here, uh, then I already get a sense that they're really interested. And same for all the process, how, depending on how fast they move in the process, gives me a little bit more security where they stand. Sure. And it says, how do you set your negotiation strategy for raising seed capital without a proper valuation? Uh, so in my opinion, there is never a proper valuation until mm -hmm. the very end. When, when you sold it, then there's the mark what it really is. Um, and I think that's the way how I always see that. So it, it's just a market price for something where for some kind of insecurity uh, and risk, and it's all priced in there, the team, the, the market, the product, your clients, and so on. So it's just finding the, the right price tag for that. And it doesn't matter if it's a seed round or a series A or B or whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I think in, in my space, there's no discounted cash flow method you can use or whatsoever to define the, the real valuation. Yeah. The real valuation is the one that somebody pays at the end. OK. And uh, another one from Ruth. What happened to the companies after exit? Growth? Actually, I, um, we've been out. Um, we, we haven't been um, active in the company anymore when we sold it. Um, so I tried also to get a little bit more distance on the company. So I'm not into the numbers anymore. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Bjorn says here, What's your top negotiation move? <laughs> because it's not so secret, as you said, <laughs> yeah. right? The top negotiation move. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm usually more the silent guy, which helps. Like letting other people speak is interesting mm -hmm. sometimes. They yeah. project a lot into my reactions where there actually is none. <laughs> um, I try to make this my, my secret power. <laughs> And so what is your ticket size, Anonymous wants to know, and what do you invest as an angel investor usually? Actually, my career as angel investor is quite short uh, because I'm now focusing on uh, my own company, Alaska, uh, mm -hmm. again. But actually, it would be somewhere, somewhere between 50 and 100 if there's something that really gets me exciting. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of Stylite, why sell and not go on with VC money? Um, I mean, there's uh, exactly this, this first negotiation with your founders where you say, if this happens, then we do X. And that came and, and happened, so we reacted as we, as we wanted to. Yeah. yeah. Um, here are some more questions about the timeline. I know a lot of people feel the time crunch. How long does it take you or did it take you from start to finish to get the deal done? Mm. It's hard to find really the start point, but I would say something like nine months or something. That's a month. pretty long. Nine. Nine months. Yeah. A month. Nine months. Um, have you negotiated with more than one potential buyer in parallel, and how have you aligned them? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, again, something I can't really disclose. Uh, it's terrible standing here and saying that for me, as I always want to sh share experience. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it was, it was an interesting ride. Let's put it that way. Um, and the last thing before we wrap up, is there a difference if you are seeking for corporates as investors? If you're seeking, I don't really get this question, to be honest. Somebody wants to stand up out of anonymity? Perhaps the question is if you're seeking, for, uh, if you're seeking investment from corporates versus angels? How would you oh, see okay. that to be different? Yeah, I think the, uh, the decision makers are different. Mm -hmm. So for angels, it's always their own money, which is a different quality to having a big corporate where you're, having, yeah. where you're kind of an employee. I think that's basically the biggest uh, difference that you see. Fantastic. Benjamin, thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a hand, please, for Benjamin Winter. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.